30 by 40 foot studio, it might have been possible that I would have had some ideas for narrative work at that time. But, you know, I'm working within my environment. I'm working within my day-to-day -day living and what I have to work with. Um, so I don't have a motion picture camera. I don't know how to do the videos on my still cameras. Um, I mean, I know how to push the button, but I never made a motion picture with it. Uh, the, the, the phone's way easier to do that with. Right. <laughs> and, um, yeah, no, I just, uh, I, I just see what happens. And um, I like making the stuff with what I have in the studio. I don't really mm -hmm. go out and get props. Right. Like, that's why I use boxes. I mean, they show up every day on our front porch from Amazon, <laughs> right? So, I mean, they're here, so let's do something with them. Right. Uh, so that's how I'm working. And that's how I've been working for a few years. And I, I again, it's enjoyable. And we'll see. Uh, I just don't know um, that I don't have any motion picture ideas. All right. And uh, you don't have any scripts lying around that need to be <laughs> stolen. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, we still have um, uh, this comedian friend and I. We wrote three or four sitcom strips scripts years ago and i just got through photo, doing portrait commissions for a um a, a sitcom producer in california and i sent him to her and actually also to perry gilpin now perry gilpin is an actress she has her own production company she's from dallas she was in uh frazier right right she did my makeup on my uh, domestic drama. It was she, domestic, she used to be I mean, the voice of Wells Fargo, right? Am I, I, am I remembering that? She's got that? a nice, gruffy voice. Yeah, that was her. Her, her brother's the next in one stage of in banking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. She she did all the makeup on my um, Near Modern Disaster series. Oh, my. And we sent her scripts, and we got just the standard letter back, like, thanks for sending your scripts. <laughs> oh, wow. So that's how difficult it is yeah. to... Get anybody to pay attention. Now you really have to self-produce. And you were saying there's a ven there, yes, yeah. there's venues, there's many outlets to do in your right. own thing. Um, I just don't have it in me. I don't think yeah. right now. So uh, why didn't you ever move to California? Okay, uh, and that and I've been asked, you know, uh, why I didn't move to New York because that was really where I grew up as an artist. I mean, that's right. where you know when I first started, I was. I didn't really get that much recognition in Dallas or in Texas, right. except for those curators and the dealers. But as far as the collectors and that, it really wasn't much at the beginning. And Janet Kuttner, who was always wonderful about writing about the work. But um, when, at the age of 24, I graduated from college, opened a camera shop and got married in like six months. We had four, in 78, we had our first daughter. That's when I actually started focusing on making art, uh -huh. 78 and 90. It, it was financially prohibitive to move to New York and have a studio big right. enough for me to work in, you know, a child in private schools and whatever rent right. it was at the time. I wasn't into that. I wasn't going to bohemian my entire family right for my cause that we really didn't know Understood. what was going to happen. And again, um, no one expected to make any money at this back then. Right. And the most expensive photograph was 900 bucks. Right. Not mine. I'm talking about in the world, basically. Right. I mean, I think um, I could have bought Moonrise over Hernandez for $600 in like 1977. Wow. Yeah. So... Yeah, it wasn't like painting. You could you could make a lot of money at painting, but you couldn't at photographs. California was never something that I had much success in until Linda Cathcart, who was the director of the Contemporary Arts Museum, who discovered me, moved to mm -hmm. California and opened a gallery. And that's where things really kind of, a lot happened for me in California at that time. Or not happened for me, but I right. more people knew about my work there. Um, I, I did really, you know, Chicago was another place where things went well. And we considered that at one point because that was like a real city. You could drive right. a car. You could live in a place right. you could afford almost. Um, but, I, again, it really wasn't worth moving everyone by the time. I guess it was affordable or made sense. Um, you know, the kids were already, you know, 
ingrained in their schools and high schools and I just didn't I didn't need to I had I did really well by not living there right better than most that lived there actually right and um, but one sort of uncomfortable story for me but funny and and totally people that have had this experience can understand um, I started out had and, and things just like magically happened in New York for, for a few years um, really well and uh, as far as like you know exhibiting and having galleries and museums and, and all that stuff and there was a writer who wrote about my work in the New York Times a few times and um, I saw him in, in Houston and we were at some big dinner there and we were talking and we were talking about playing tennis I had just taken up tennis this was in 88 mm-hmm. Or 89, something like that. And I was in New York so often that people thought I lived there. <laughs> so he goes, oh, you're playing tennis? He goes, well, call me when you get home and we'll play tennis. And I go, I'm kind of home. He says, what do you mean? I go, I live in Dallas. Last word ever written. Wow. Yeah. Cut off. Just like, oh, you're not a New Yorker. Well, then that's All it. Right. Well, yeah, you... Yeah. Well, so what 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 do you think that meant? That means because I, I don't want to read too much. I don't want to read. I it know it meant if you don't live in New York, you know that they're, they're very provincial, extremely provincial, and that didn't happen to everyone, but it happened with him. And um, I'm not going to mention which dealer I was showing with, but they had that a little bit of that attitude too. One of the partners did. Didn't right. even go to any of my retrospectives, anything. And so do you think... And s- complain to me that I didn't live in New York. So do you think it's, do you think it's any easier now to, to try to do it outside of New York than, well, than it was then? I mean, because it, it seems like the art world is... Everywhere. And I think it may be, right. And, you know, digitally... It's like there's like this, you know, third space, you know. Well, I think it's important. I think that it's important. And I, if there's anything that I do have that I really would like to do is to have another connection. I, I would like to have a presence in New York again. One reason for that is that's where people, that's where curators look. Right. You know, that's where... Um, you know, if you're if you're wanting to be in a Venice Biennale or whatever, you're not they're 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 not coming outside of they go there. You know, um, and I've, I've I've asked I don't know whose responsibility this is, but I know when I first started, um, curators were coming to Texas, and that was because the museum directors and curators that I mentioned, Sue Grays, Linda Cathcart, even Frederica Hunter, right. um, Steve Denny, Laura Carpenter, they invited them. They made, they talked it up. They made curators want to come here and see the artists that work here because there's a lot of really great art that's right. made here. And it's a giant freaking state. Right. You know, there's a, you know, between California, Texas, and New York, there's a lot of, you know, California art, okay, it's California. Got it. Right. You know, <laughs> New York is from everywhere, but it's not all great. It's, you know, small percentage that's great. Texas, same thing, but there's good artists, but there's no one inviting them here. And I've presented this since I moved back. And I can't, you know, not trying to create waves or, you know, be that artist that bitching, but I'm like, I've asked curators, you know, and I've asked Aaron and people, when was the last time? A Whitney Biennial curator has gone through Texas. Mm-hmm. I have not heard of one. Right. I, I think there might have been an artist. Well, that, Michael Oping, Oping was. Op, well, and I was in that biennial. Right. That's the one I was. That was my second biennial, in with a movie. Mm-hmm. But that was when it was the two, you know my, well Michael yeah he was the head guy in that whole deal. Right. Um, and there were other curators. I mean. Um, Valerie Castle ended up being at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston as a right. curator. But she was in Chicago when she w- was one of the biennial curators that year. And, um, but that was in 2000. Right. I mean, there's a lot of stuff they're missing out on if they really want... it. Was, but the Whitney Biennial used to be a United States thing. Let's mm-hmm. see what's happening in the country. And again, it was when there were movements. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like, let's see who in the country is making stage photographs. Let's see in the country who's making, you know, abstract expressionist art. Let's see in the country who's kind of making something that we should let people see. Right. And it's not so much that now that I could tell. Um, and especially the, the out-of-country biennials, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to what's, you know, uh, you know, they're populist sort of exhibitions, I think. Um, for the most part. I mean, I haven't witnessed them. Um, I was in Documenta 9, and um, I was the only one from Texas that was in it that year. Um, I think the only one before or after Robert Rauschenberg, as far as a Texan. And So you have to get the people here. Right. You know? I mean, that's the only way to do it. You can't send them, you know, JPEGs. You know, they have to do studio visits, and I don't really know what's going to... I I really don't know how that happens unless we get a curator, say, you know, um, someone leaving New York to come and be a curator, and they want want their friends to come look. Right. You know, I think that's important, and I don't think that's... As far as I tell, since Michael, there hasn't been one that's done that. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and was it, I guess, would it be, yeah, it's a conversation that's come up on, on, uh, in other conversations here about, you know, curators being more, would curators be more willing to come down here if it was easier to get between Houston and Dallas and like make it all one trip and, yeah, you know, you know here's, I have a friend, um, uh, my friend James Drake, the artist. Um, you could just talk to James. He's going to be in. A, he lives in Santa Fe now, but uh-huh. he'll move to. Uh, he'll be in Austin for um, several months a year after September or October. Right. But James, um, we, we always we met for lunch. You know, at least once a week while we were both living in Santa Fe. We're real good friends, and we're always you know trying to fix the art world. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, he was saying like, uh, side Santa Fe. And I'm sure the Dallas, all of them, Dallas Museum, whatever, you know, they, they, they can come up with a budget to like, okay, say you find out who the Whitney Biennial curator is. Mm-hmm. Okay, how about, okay, we're going to give you 10 grand. Mm-hmm. We're going to take this out of this one lecture we were going to do, or this one budget. We're going to give you $10,000 going to fly you to texas we're going to mm-hmm. put you up in a good hotel you know drive you to these studio visits and s- pay for your expenses and send you back to new york right now that doesn't mean that doesn't guarantee anything and it right. shouldn't guarantee anything if they don't see anything they like or that justifies their thesis for the right. show that's fine but they will see it yeah you know and what it's, al- it's almost wrong. like in my mind, maybe it's me just coming from like a business background. It's almost like you know, there's not a chamber of commerce for the artist community here, right? Like, because that's the sort of thing like a chamber of commerce would do. Like, oh, hey, no. let, let's pay, you know, let's pay to uh, fly in, you know, this particular company it, you know, or this, thing is, you know, to it benefits everyone. Absolutely. You know, so why can't? The MFA in Houston, the DMA, and the Fort Worth Modern all put in $3,333 a piece. And believe me, a curator would accept ten grand in a minute. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, they don't make that much money. Right. You know, at least they didn't. I don't know what they make now, but I don't think, I think it would be, right. you know, half of a car. <laughs> right. Or a third. Well, nowadays it's like a fifth of a car. Right, right. But, um yeah, I mean, plus they would be they'd be wined and dined by every you know the the, sure. the the you know they would go to the major collectors and see their collection and I, I just think there's got to be something to draw them and I'm not really sure you know I, mean, the, I feel like e- e- the e- Nasher e- Prize should have but I didn't see any there that I right. had known of you know I, I feel like you know there's probably seems like it would be in the wheelhouse of a collector. Yes, it would. Right? Because, you know, you know what's in it for the collector? Well, if the collector, you know, is able to uh, expose this person to someone that he is collecting, and now, you know, his, 
you know, this pre-biennial pieces that he has purchased.